Skill Review 1. Psychology Some people can remember things in a way that seems almost impossible. It's as if their minds just take photos. They might be able to repeat a lecture word for word. They can even accomplish this feat many years later. Some very good chess players can play with their eyes covered. This is called blindfold chess. They can play against several other players at once and win. Someone tells them the other player's moves. They can easily remember where the pieces are on all the boards. Scientists call this eidetic memory, though many people call it photographic memory. However, this may be misleading. Scientists believe the memories are not stored photographically, but in another way. A scientist named Dr. De Groot did a test to show this. A chessboard was set up a certain way, and some chess players were given 15 seconds to look at it. Then, they were asked to set the pieces up again in the same way. The more seasoned chess players easily set up the pieces again. The beginners had a more difficult time doing it. In the next test, Dr. De Groot began in the same way. However, this time he set them up in a way that would never happen in a real game. Now, the really good players had difficulty remembering too, remembering only as well as the beginning players. It seemed they needed to apply their knowledge of what was really possible in a game. That is, they needed to apply what they knew about chess to remember well. Number 1. What is the talk mainly about? Number 2. How does the professor explain eidetic memory? Choose three answers. Number 3. Why does the professor say this? Now, the really good players had difficulty remembering too, remembering only as well as the beginning players. It seemed they needed to apply their knowledge of what was really possible in a game. Number 4. Match the words below with the correct category. Number 5. What can be inferred from the talk? Number 6. The professor explains the process in the experiment. Summarize the process by putting the steps in the correct order. Two, general studies. Some people really go overboard using their yellow markers to underline everything. I'm going to suggest that this isn't the best strategy for studying. The first time you read a passage, don't highlight you can end up with an all-yellow text. Just read the passage first, then ponder it for a while, then read it again, this time looking for the most important ideas. In the next reading, you can start highlighting. Only underline one or two key words or phrases per page. Even better, compile a list of the words and phrases. Write the page number beside each one so you can look them up again. Now, when you review, you won't have pages and pages to read. This makes it much easier to review for an exam. Excuse me, Professor Hill? Yes, Jacqueline? Can you give us some suggestions on how to choose the words and phrases? Yes, of course. Here are some steps to help you decide what to choose. 1. Look for the main idea. Follow the way it's being told through the passage. 2. Look at the beginning and ending paragraphs. They often give the information in a simple form. 3. Pick out transitional words that give you important information, i.e., the point is, in sum, most importantly, and so on. 4. Try reading the ending first. 
so you know where the passage is going. 5. The next day, look over the passage again. Only read what you've underlined. Do it again a week later. Now each night for several nights before a test, look at your list. Take an hour or two. You'll remember some things from class. When you find something you can't remember, look it up. You'll learn what you don't remember this way. You'll have no problem getting a high score on the exam. Learning this does take time, though, so don't get discouraged. Keep practicing. You'll get it. Number 1. What is the talk mainly about? Number 2. What should students do when they read a passage a week after the first reading? Number 3. Why does the professor say this? Try reading the ending first, so you know where the passage is going. Number 4. Complete the table according to information in the lecture by matching the examples with the correct space. Number 5. What does the professor mean when he says this? Keep practicing. You'll get it. Number 6. The professor explains how to use the keywords and phrases in a reading passage to study for an exam. Summarize the process by putting the steps in order. Chapter 2 Long Passage Skill Practice Skill A Understanding Main Ideas and Organization 1. Culture Let's talk about sneezing. When someone sneezes, ah-choo, the customary response is, bless you or God bless you. Why do we say this? There are several theories. Some of these are superstitions, that is, things that many people believe but that aren't really true. One superstition is that saying bless you keeps the devil from flying down your throat. Another is that bless you keeps your soul from flying out of your body. Actually, there is a historical reason for this custom. There was a pope in Rome named Gregory the Great. When he was elected pope, the Great Plague was beginning all over Europe. Thousands of people were dying. In fact, the Pope before Gregory had died of the plague. To get rid of the plague, Pope Gregory ordered people to march through the streets asking for God's help. If someone sneezed, others would immediately say, God bless you. They hoped this would keep the person who sneezed from getting the plague. Today, of course, we know that when you sneeze, the devil isn't trying to rush down your throat. Your soul won't leave your body. And saying bless you to sneezers in the street is not going to cure disease. We do know, though, that each sneeze forces thousands of germs into the air. People keep germs out of public places by covering their mouths when they sneeze. And hearing an old-fashioned bless you from a stranger can make us feel better when the sneezes begin. Number 1. What is the talk mainly about? Number 2. What is the main idea of the talk? Number 3. Which two statements are correct? Choose two answers. Number 4. What does the professor imply when he says this? To get rid of the plague, Pope Gregory ordered people to march through the streets asking for God's help.
two, Campus Life. Hey, Alex. How's it going? Okay, I just finished math class. Man, I hate math. Why? It's easy. Yeah, right. I've got a secret that helps me in math class. Want to know what it is? Okay, but it probably won't help me. Listen and try it. Math is too abstract, right? Well, try to make it real for yourself. My secret is I think about numbers in math as if they were money. Huh? Yeah, I have had a hard time picturing numbers, but if I see the numbers as dollars and cents, then I can see them clearly in my head. Really? Yeah, for example, if the teacher says, What is 853 minus 727? I think of $8.53 minus $7.27. The answer is $1.26. $1.26. It's easy. Hey, that's awesome. I'll try it tomorrow. Thanks. No problem. See you at the basketball game tonight. See you. Number one. What is the man's problem? Number two. What is the woman's main point? Number three. What does the woman advise the man to do? Listen again to part of the conversation and answer the question. I just finished math class. Man, I hate math. Why? It's easy. Yeah, right. Number four. What does the speaker mean when he says this? Yeah, right. Three. Computer science. More people are buying home computers and using them for home networks. They need faster ways to get information over the Internet. Right now, there are mainly two avenues for information to be sent. These are cable modems and asymmetric digital subscriber lines, or ADSL. These faster ways of sending information are called broadband connections. Cable modems and ADSL are both types of broadband connections. They are much faster than a 56K modem. There is another new kind of DSL connection. It is known as Very High Bit Rate DSL, or VDSL. Some companies already have this for certain places. VDSL isn't everywhere yet, but it may be very soon. Many people like it and are beginning to use it. VDSL accommodates a very, very large amount of bandwidth. It gives up to about 52 megabytes per second. In other words, it provides 52 MBPs. In comparison, ADSL or cable modems can only give 8 to 10 megabytes per second. It's easy to see that VDSL is a lot faster. VDSL will soon be more common, making home networks cost much less. In the United States, a telephone line has two copper wires. These wires have a very broad bandwidth. A telephone call only uses a very small part of the bandwidth. The telephone wires can carry much more information than telephone calls. DSL can use this extra bandwidth at the same time a call is being made. It can do this without changing the sound of the telephone call. 1. How does the speaker present information about DSL connections? Two. What are the three main ideas in the talk? Choose three answers. Three. What type of internet connection is the fastest? Four. What does the professor imply when she says this? 
there is another new kind of DSL connection. It is known as Very High Bit Rate DSL, or VDSL. Some companies already have this for certain places. Four, Campus Life. Hey Lucy, are you going to watch any of the movies at the film festival? No, I wasn't thinking of it. I have too much homework to do. Ah, that's no fun. Can't you even take one night off? Your dormitory is so close to the Annenberg Center. It'll take you five minutes to get there. Well, maybe I'll go to one. How about tomorrow night? I can go then. What movie is playing? School of Rock. Have you seen it? No. What's it about? Well, it's a comedy, and it's really funny. It's about this guy who's really trying to make it as a rock star. He gets kicked out of his band, and he really needs money. So he acts like he's somebody else to get a teaching job. Then he tries to turn his class into a rock band. Sounds pretty crazy. Okay, I'll come see it. Number one. What is the topic of the conversation? Number two. What is the man's main point? Number three. What does the man want the woman to do? Number four. What does the man mean when he says this? How about tomorrow night? I can go then. Five. Biology. Most animals in the world have some kind of way to hide themselves so that they can hunt for food and protect themselves from other animals. This method of hiding is called camouflage. C A M O U F L A G E. The simplest form of camouflage is for animals to blend in with their surroundings. Their colors match the surroundings in which they live. Which makes them hard to see. Deer and other forest animals, for example, have light brown colors that help them blend in with the brown trees and dirt on the forest ground. Many fish have a gray blue color. This helps them blend in with the soft light underwater. Other animals use color patterns to help them blend in. A tiger's pattern of black stripes. An orange fur blends into the long grass where it hunts. This makes the tiger difficult for its victims to spot, until it's too late. Another form of camouflage is called copying. For instance, a king snake is red, yellow, and black. It copies the colors of the coral snake. The coral snake is very dangerous. Its bite can kill you. The king snake is not dangerous, but other animals are afraid to attack the king snake because it looks like a coral snake. A third form of camouflage is disguise, D I S G U I S E. This means that an animal looks like something else. For instance, a crocodile in the water can look just like a floating log. This disguise. Helps it catch deer when they come near the water to drink. Number one, how does the professor organize the information in the lecture? Number two, what are the three main types of camouflage mentioned in the talk? Number three, which animals use camouflage to blend in with their surroundings? Number four, why does the professor say this? The simplest form of camouflage is for animals to blend in with their surroundings.
Their colors match the surroundings in which they live, which makes them hard to see. Six psychology. Do you ever wonder why we dream? Many people do. For centuries, in fact, people have been trying to understand what our dreams mean or if they mean anything at all. In ancient Egypt, about 2000 BC, people thought dreams were very important. They believed that dreams foretold what would happen in the future. The Egyptians wrote books that listed what dreams meant. If a man saw himself looking out a window in his dream, it was considered a good omen. It meant that his cry would be heard by a god. If a man saw himself in his dream looking at people who were far away, it was considered a bad sign. It meant that he was soon going to die. In modern times, Sigmund Freud is famous for his research on dreams. Freud believed that his dreams represent our suppressed desires, things we want to do but can't. Dreams allow our minds to act out desires that we can't express in our everyday lives. Usually, these suppressed desires involve sex. For example, a train going into a tunnel represents a man and woman having sex. According to Freud, this dream would mean you want to have sex, but for some reason you can't. Another famous dream researcher was Carl Jung, um, J U N G. Jung believed dreams allow us to think more about ourselves than when we are awake, and to solve problems that we have during the day. In 1973, researchers named Alan Hobson and Robert Macaulay said dreams don't mean anything. Dreams are just the result of natural activity in our brains. Number one. What is the talk mainly about? Number two. What is the speaker's main point? Number three. Which two statements are correct? Choose two answers. Number four. What does the professor imply when she says this? For centuries, in fact, people have been trying to understand what our dreams mean or if they mean anything at all. Skill B. Understanding details and facts. One. Biology. I'm still confused about the lecture today on blood types. Okay. What questions do you have? Well, first, the way we classify blood types, we use the letters A, B, and O, right? That's right. There are four different types of blood: A, B, A, B, and O. Each person on Earth has one of these types. And where do we get our blood types? They come from both our father and mother. Your blood type could be the same as one of your parents, or completely different. But everyone's blood is red. Yes, it all looks the same, but it's dangerous to mix two different blood types together. If you get hurt and need blood, you have to make sure the new blood is the same type as yours. If it's not, you might die. But didn't the professor say there was one type that could mix with any of them? Yes, that's type O. Number one. What are the speakers mainly discussing? Number two. What is the man's main point? Number three. What does the woman want to know about blood types? Listen again to part of the conversation. Then answer the question. Well, first, the way we classify blood types, we use the letters A, B, and O, right? Number four. What can be inferred about the female student?
Two, literature. Folk tales are stories that grow out of the lives or imaginations of people or folk. Folk tales began as an attempt to explain and understand the world around us. Many folk tales all over the world are nearly the same. Travelers pass them on from one country to another. Each person telling the folk tale changes it slightly. The stories that traveled mostly over land changed a great deal. The ones that traveled by water changed less. There are many different kinds of folk tales. Some have simple plots with lots of repeated phrases and words. These are called cumulative folk tales. One example is called "There was an old lady who swallowed a fly." This sentence is repeated on almost every page of the story. In some stories, animals talk just like humans. These are talking beast folk tales. A famous example is "The Three Little Pigs." Humorous tales are meant for fun and nonsense. They are usually about someone who makes unbelievably funny mistakes, such as the Norwegian husband who has to take care of his house and nearly destroys it. Romances are stories in which lovers seem hopelessly separated until magic brings them back together. A good example is Beauty and the Beast. Tales of magic are types of stories we commonly call fairy tales. These include things like talking mirrors, enchanted forests, and magic kisses. Snow White is a popular example. Number one, what is the talk mainly about? Number two, according to the professor, what might be included in a folk tale? Number three, what is the topic of the talk? Number four, why does the professor say this? Romances are stories in which lovers seem hopelessly separated until magic brings them back together. Three, campus life. Hello, Lance. What can I help you with today? I heard there's a tutoring center for each department. Can you tell me where it is for the English department? Yes, ours is just next door. Can I go there right now? You can, but they might still be at lunch. You know, you'll have to sign up for an interview first anyway. You can do that over the internet too. Okay. Can you give me the address? Go to www.penttutoring.info. They'll get in touch with you within three working days. What will they send me? They'll send you the tutor's name, phone number, email address. Uh, oh yes, and how much you have to pay per hour. Uh oh, I don't have any money. That's okay. You can get free tutoring. You'll just need to agree to do a three-week feedback survey. That's all. That's all. Great. Thanks. No problem. Number one. What are the speakers mainly discussing? Number two. What does the secretary tell the student? Number three. What is the student's main point? Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. You know, you'll have to sign up for an interview first anyway. You can do that over the internet too. Okay. Can you give me the address? Number four. What can be inferred about the student? Four. Biology. Spiders can spin silk better than any other insect.
only a few others, like silkworms, can make silk. Spiders use silk in many different ways. They often use it the same way a mountain climber uses rope. They'll drop down on a silk strand. They get into trouble. They can quickly run back up again. Another way they use silk is to make homes for their babies. Most kinds of spiders spin a thick silk covering around their eggs. Some spin it around the new little spiders. Spiders can make different kinds of silk strands. One way is to coat a silk strand with different materials. They might make it sticky to catch a fly. I think we've all seen a fly getting stuck on a spider's web. You sometimes notice because the fly buzzes loudly. Or a spider might waterproof the silk with something. Then they can stay dry in a rainstorm. Trapdoor spider's home is a good example. The door over the trapdoor spider's hole is a waterproof roof made of spider silk. Number one. What is the talk mainly about? Number two. According to the professor, what kind of coating might silk have? Number three. What are the three main ideas in the talk? Choose three answers. Number four. Why does the professor say this? Or a spider might waterproof the silk with something. Then they can stay dry in a rainstorm. Five. Physics. A good way to understand why balloons float in the air is to understand why things float in water. Let's say that you have a plastic one-liter bottle of Coca-Cola. If you pour out the Coke and put the cap back on, you have a one-liter bottle full of air. Now tie a string around it and take it to the bottom of a swimming pool. What will happen when you let go of the bottle? It will rise to the top. Yes. If you sit on the bottom of the pool holding the string, the bottle will act just like a balloon does in the air. Does anyone know why the bottle rises? Uh, because the air is um lighter than the water. Exactly. The bottle and the air inside it weigh just a few grams, but a liter of water weighs about one thousand grams. The air is lighter than the water the air displaces, so the bottle floats. We call this the law of buoyancy. Balloons work by the same law of buoyancy, except balloons are filled with helium, not air. Helium is a gas that is much lighter than air. You can think of the helium balloon you are holding as floating in a huge pool of air. The helium balloon displaces an amount of air, just like the empty bottle displaces an amount of water. As long as the helium and the balloon are lighter than the air they displace, the balloon will float in the air. Number one. What is the talk mainly about? Number two. What is the speaker's main point? Number three. How does the professor explain the law of buoyancy? Choose two answers. Number four. Why does the professor say this? You can think of the helium balloon you are holding as floating in a huge pool of air. The helium balloon displaces an amount of air, just like the empty bottle displaces an amount of water. Six. Health. Mmm. I love coffee. It wakes me up. You know why? Because it has caffeine. Caffeine is a kind of drug. Ah, caffeine is found naturally in many plants, such as coffee beans, tea leaves, and cocoa nuts.
It's also added artificially to many other kinds of food and drinks. So, it's safe to say that the typical American gets plenty of caffeine. As a matter of fact, most of us get too much. More than half of all adults in the United States consume more than 300 milligrams of caffeine each day, including me. Seriously, though, too much caffeine is not good for your body. Caffeine interferes with a chemical in your brain called adenosine. That's A-D-E-N-O-S-I-N-E. Now, normally, adenosine helps prepare your body for rest. This chemical slows down nerve cells, which causes you to become sleepy. To the nerve cells in your brain, caffeine looks just like adenosine, but caffeine acts differently. Instead of slowing down your nerve cells, caffeine speeds them up. As a result, your heart starts to beat faster. Your breathing tubes open wider. Your blood pressure rises. Blood vessels tighten near the surface of your skin. The blood flowing into your stomach slows down. Your muscles tighten up, ready for action. This is why, after consuming a big cup of coffee, you feel excited. You can feel your heartbeat increasing. You're ready to do something, go somewhere, run, play, fight, conquer the world, or else start studying to get ready for the next test. Number 1. What aspect of caffeine does the professor mainly discuss? Number 2. According to the professor, what is adenosine? Number 3. What is the speaker's main point? Number four, what does the professor imply when she says this? More than half of all adults in the United States consume more than 300 milligrams of caffeine each day, including me. Scale C. Determining Reasons, Purposes, and Attitudes 1. Science We use microscopes to help us study cells. Because cells are so small, we can't see them without magnification. Um, the ability to make them look bigger. The first microscopes were called light microscopes. They were pretty simple devices. They were also simple to use. Scientists first cut the cells or specimens into thin sections. Then they stained the specimens with different colored materials called dyes. The dyes helped them see the specimens more clearly. Unfortunately, dyes often killed the cells too. That limited what scientists could find out about the specimen. In recent years, we have developed more powerful microscopes. These help us view living specimens. One of these new microscopes is called the phase contrast microscope. It's made in such a way that part of the light passing through it moves more slowly than the rest of the light. We say this part of the light is out of phase with the rest of the light. This enables scientists to see differences in living specimens as light and shade. Another type of new microscope is the electron microscope. This uses electrons to form images instead of light. Electrons travel in waves, similar to light, but their wavelengths are over 100,000 times shorter than those of light. Therefore, they can give much clearer magnification. Electron microscopes even allow scientists to take pictures of the cells they are studying. Number 1. Why does the professor mention dyes? Number 2. 
Why can electrons give clearer magnification than light? Number 3. What is the speaker's main point? Listen again to part of the lecture and answer the question. Unfortunately, dyes often killed the cells too. That limited what scientists could find out about the specimen. Number 4. What does the professor imply when she says this? That limited what scientists could find out about the specimen. Two, campus life. Hey Frank, if you could be any person in the world, who would you be? That's easy, Bill Gates. Why? I'll give you 30 billion reasons. <laughs> ah, so it's the money. Not totally, but the money is nice. I was reading that if you made all of Gates's money $1 bills and then laid them end to end, the line would stretch for almost 6 million kilometers. Wow. But what would you do with all that money? Gates gives a lot to the poor. He's donated almost seven and a half billion since the year 2000. I'd give away even more. Really? Sure. It costs about $240 a year to feed a starving child. So Bill could save almost 121 million children. Hmm. Why else do you like Gates? I admire his confidence. Did you know he earned a scholarship to Harvard, but left after two years to start Microsoft? That took courage. Number 1. Why does the man describe laying dollar bills end to end? Number 2. Why does the man admire Bill Gates? Number 3. What is the man's main point? Listen again to part of the conversation and answer the question. If you could be any person in the world, who would you be? That's easy, Bill Gates. Why? I'll give you 30 billion reasons. <laughs> Number 4. What does the man mean when he says this? I'll give you 30 billion reasons. <laughs> Three history. So you've heard of the Gettysburg Address, but do you know the story behind it? The worst battle of the American Civil War was fought in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The Northern Army fought back the Southern Army. The battle lasted three days. Afterward, the field was left covered with bodies of dead soldiers. In November 1863, President Abraham Lincoln came to Gettysburg. He was to speak at the opening of the cemetery there. Music played and soldiers saluted. Edward Everett, governor of Massachusetts, talked first for almost two hours. Then Lincoln stood up. He looked out over the valley. Then he began to speak. He said they couldn't do anything to make this place special. He said that the soldiers who had fought so hard had already done that. He said that everyone would soon forget what was spoken that day, but he said that what the soldiers did would never be forgotten. He said everyone should keep doing what these soldiers began. They should keep fighting for freedom for all the people. Then they could make sure the soldiers didn't die needlessly. The president's speech only lasted two minutes. Everyone cheered and then left. Lincoln turned to Edward Everett. He said he thought he should have planned his speech better. Edward Everett didn't agree. He said, it was perfect. You said more in two minutes than I did in two hours. Afterward, the newspapers said it was a great speech. And as you know, Americans still remember it today. Number 1. Why did Lincoln go to Gettysburg?
Number 2. What is the speaker's main point? Number 3. Why did Lincoln say they couldn't do anything to make the play special? Listen again to part of the lecture and answer the question. The president's speech only lasted two minutes. Everyone cheered and then left. Lincoln turned to Edward Everett. He said he thought he should have planned his speech better. Number four. Why does the speaker say this? He said he thought he should have planned his speech better. Four. Phys ed. Some people are surprised to know that walking is very good exercise. It seems very easy, but it does us a lot of good. It cleans the blood, tones up muscles, and strengthens bones. It even helps people lose weight. One study showed that fast walking keeps your heart healthy. Men who walked fast were 50% less likely to have heart disease. You don't need much equipment to do it. And almost anyone, anywhere, at any time can do it. It's not difficult to plan walks into your day. You can walk to work, to catch a train, or to a park. You can walk to shops or enjoy walks in the country. It's a great way to spend time with family and friends. People have some of their best conversations while walking. It's best to do some stretches before and after you walk. Take short, quick steps. Stand straight and take deep breaths. For basic health, it's good to walk most days of the week. Walk for 20 to 30 minutes or more at a talking pace. To lose weight, walk for 30 to 45 minutes or more. Walk as many days as you can. Walk fast enough so that you finish slightly out of breath. To make your heart stronger, walk quickly for 20 minutes or more. If you can walk where there are some small hills, walk two or three times a week. Go as fast as you can, but enjoy yourself. Exercise should never be painful. Number one. Why does the professor suggest everyone should walk? Number two. What are the three main ideas in the presentation? Choose three answers. Number three. Why should people walk with friends or family? Number four. What does the professor imply when she says this? To make your heart stronger, walk quickly for 20 minutes or more. If you can, walk where there are some small hills. Five. Campus life. Josh, what are you doing tonight? I have a biology class. What are you doing? Well, my friend's sorority is having a party, but I don't want to walk by myself in the dark. Why don't you use campus escort? What's that? Campus Escort is a free service that gives students rides. Other students drive you to the place you're going. Really? It's free? Yep. Just call 874 SAFE and tell them what time you would like to be picked up. But will they escort me back home? Sure. There's a car that will take you from your dorm room to the party, then back to your dorm. It runs 5 p.m. to 1 a.m., and there's a small van that picks students up each hour at the student center in the mall. It runs from 6 p.m. to midnight. What if I want to stay later? Call campus police for a free escort. 874-2121. Number 1. Why does the woman need an escort? Number 2. Why is the woman concerned? Number three. What is the man's main point?
Listen to part of the conversation, then answer the question. But I don't want to walk by myself in the dark. Number 4. What can be inferred about the student? Six general studies. All right, Saturday's the big day. Are you ready? Yes, Susan. Tests make me nervous. What can I do? Good question. It's natural to be a little nervous before a test. The important thing is don't panic. You've studied hard for this test. You can pass it. Be confident. Relax. Now, you're more likely to be relaxed if you are well prepared. Here are some tips. First, before you leave home, check to make sure you have everything you need. You should have your admission ticket. This was mailed to you last week. You should have two number two pencils and a good eraser. You should have identification your student ID card, a driver's license, or a passport. If you're taking the math portion of the test, you should have a calculator. Second, Know what you can't bring to the test. You cannot bring a watch with a loud alarm. You cannot bring any food or drink. You cannot bring extra paper to write on. You cannot bring any books, notes, or dictionaries. You cannot bring compasses, rulers, protractors, or other aids except for the calculator. You cannot bring colored pens, pencils, or highlighters. You cannot bring cell phones or pagers. You cannot bring any portable tape recorders, Walkmans, or headphones. Questions? Um, what if I, uh, have to go to the bathroom during the test? You can't, so go before. Don't worry, there will be breaks after each section of the test. You'll be able to go then. Number one. Why do students need identification? Number two. According to the professor, why is it important to be prepared for the test? Number three. What is the speaker's main point? Listen again to part of the conversation and answer the question. All right. Saturday's the big day. Are you ready? Number four. What does the professor mean when he says this? Saturday's the big day. Skill review. One. Campus life. All right. Here's your student ID card. You'll need to show this at every meal or each time you buy something at a campus dining hall. Really? Hmm, that's different than my old school. Yes, I imagine it is. We have a unique system here. Do you know about our meal plans? Meal plans? Uh, no. There are several different plans. You can choose to buy 9, 12, 15, or 18 meals each week. It depends on your schedule and eating habits. I see. Um, what if I buy the 15 meal plan and only eat 13 meals that week? Will I get 17 the next week? No, meals do not carry over into the next week. That's why it's important that you choose your meal plan carefully. What if I want to treat my friend? Can I use two meals at one time? Sorry, no. Only one meal each meal period. If you want to treat a friend, you can use your declining balance points. My what? Declining balance points. They work like an ATM card. At the dining halls, you use the points like cash. You can buy food, snacks, or meals. Then the points are withdrawn from your declining balance account. All of our meal plans offer these points. Uh, okay. What happens when I run out of declining balance points? You can buy more points at any time. Just go to the One Card office on the North Campus. We will bill your home through the Student Accounts office. Number one. What should the student use to buy a meal for a friend?
Number two. Which two statements are correct? Choose two answers. Number three. What is the topic of the conversation? Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. That's different than my old school. Yes, I imagine it is. We have a unique system here. Number four. What does the man think about the school's meal plan system? Number five. Why must students choose their meal plan carefully? Listen again to part of the conversation and answer the question. Meals do not carry over into the next week. That's why it's important that you choose your meal plan carefully. Number six. What does the administrator mean when he says this? Meals do not carry over into the next week. Two. Geography. We usually think of deserts as hot, dry, sandy places, and many deserts are. But actually, deserts come in several forms. Let's learn about some of them. In defining a desert, we have to consider two factors. The first is the annual amount of rainfall. Deserts get less than 250 millimeters of rain or snow each year. The second factor is how much of that rain or snow evaporates, that is, goes back into the atmosphere or is used up by plants. We call this loss of water evaporation. Simply stated, a desert is a place where evaporation is greater than rainfall or snowfall. Because so much water evaporates, most deserts are hot. But not all. The North and South Poles, for instance, are cold deserts. They get less than 250 millimeters of snow each year, and the ground is permanently frozen. We also classify deserts by their location and main weather pattern. One example is trade wind deserts. Trade wind deserts are located between 30 degrees. And 35 degrees north and south of the equator. The winds that blow over these areas are very strong. They blow away clouds, so more sun reaches the ground. Most of the major deserts in the world lie in the areas crossed by the trade winds. The Sahara Desert in North Africa is a trade wind desert. Temperatures there can reach 57 degrees Celsius. Another type of desert is the rain shadow desert. Rain shadow deserts lie next to tall mountains. As clouds rise over the mountains, they spill all of their rain or snow before they get to the other side. So these deserts are formed in the shadow of the mountains. The Judean Desert in Israel is a rain shadow desert. So is a large part of the western United States, called the Great Basin. Still another kind of desert is the coastal desert. Coastal deserts are on the western edges or coasts of continents. One coastal desert, the Atacama Desert of South America, is Earth's driest desert. In the Atacama. There can be measurable rainfall only once every 50 years. Number one. What are two key features of deserts mentioned in the lecture? Choose two answers. Number two. How does the professor explain rain shadow deserts? Choose two answers. Number three. What is the talk mainly about?
Number 4. Why does the professor mention the North and South Poles? Number 5. Why is the Sahara Desert called a trade wind desert? Number 6. What does the professor imply when she says this? As clouds rise over the mountains, they spill all of their rain or snow before they get to the other side. So, these deserts are formed in the shadow of the mountains. Three business writing. Today, I'd like to give you some basic rules for writing a resume. Let's begin with spelling. Don't use words you don't know. Use a dictionary. Seems like a lot of trouble to get up, find a dictionary, and look up the word. But if you're on the computer, you can look up words online. Do a spell check, but then read every word carefully. The spell check can't catch every mistake. If you use form instead of from, it won't catch it. So use a spell check, but read everything yourself too. And read carefully. If you read quickly, it's easy to miss words that are misspelled. Have a friend read your resume too. Another thing choose your words carefully. Some words sound alike, but don't mean the same thing. Like these. Personal means private. Personnel Means staff members. And use active tense, like directed staff, rather than the passive tense, like was staff director. The active tense gives a stronger feeling. Now, about grammar. In each part of your resume, keep the same tense. The duties you do now should be in the present tense. Things you did in the past should be in the past tense. For example, let's say you started your job several years ago in September. You might write on your resume, September 2003 to present, manage office and staff. Or, teach at Canyon High School. That means, I manage or I teach now. But if you're listing a job you don't have anymore, Taught at Canyon High School instead of teach at Canyon High School. Don't give your sex, age, race, or marital status. How much money you made before is also personal information. Make your resume look nice. Make it as simple as you can too. Leave plenty of space, but try to make it just one page. Use a font like Times Roman. That's easy to read. Put your name, address, and telephone number on it, and any letters. Use a good printer and print on only one side of white paper. Your resume speaks for you. A professional looking resume tells an employer that you do things well. An employer may decide to see you or not because of it. Number one. What is the speaker's main point? Number two. According to the speaker, what can you do if you're not sure of the meaning of a word? Choose two answers. Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Do a spell check, but then read every word carefully. The spell check can't catch every mistake. Number three. How does the speaker feel about spell check programs? Number four. Why should you choose your words carefully? Number five. 
Why should your resume look professional? Number 6. What does the professor imply when he says this? Don't give your sex, age, race or marital status. How much money you made before is also personal information. Four, economics. Our world is so rich. All the people together make more than $31 trillion a year. In some countries, many people make more than $40,000 a year. But in other countries, many people make less than $700 a year. Of these, 1.2 billion earn less than $1 a day. Because of this, 33,000 children die every day in these poorer countries. Each minute, more than one woman dies in childbirth. Being poor keeps more than 100 million children out of school. Most of them are girls. Helping the poorer countries is a very big task, especially because more people are born every year. In 50 years, there will be about 3 billion more people. The World Bank is a bridge between the rich and poor people. It's making rich country money into poor country growth. It is one of the world's biggest banks for poor countries. It's helping them build schools and health centers and get water and electricity. It's helping protect the people's surroundings. The low-income countries can't usually borrow money in world markets. If they do, they have to pay very high interest rates. The World Bank gives them some money, low-interest loans, and interest-free credit. It helps them take care of the money, too. When the countries get loans, they have 35 to 40 years to pay them back. They can have 10 extra years if they need it. In the year 2002, the bank agreed to give about $15 billion to low-income countries. For some of the poorest countries, AIDS is a very big problem. Some of this World Bank money is to help them fight this disease. If they don't receive help, many more people will get the illness. The World Bank is not like other banks. It's really a part of the United Nations. 184 countries belong to it. These countries all put money into it and help maintain it. About 10,000 people work in World Bank offices. They are from nearly every country in the world. Its headquarters is in Washington, D.C. But there are World Bank offices in 109 countries. Number 1. What does the World Bank do? Number 2. How does the professor explain that not everyone is rich? Choose two answers. Number 3. What is the talk mainly about? Listen again to part of the lecture and answer the question. But in other countries, many people make less than $700 a year. Of these, 1.2 billion earn less than $1 a day. Because of this, 33,000 children die every day in these poorer countries. Number 4. What does the speaker mean when she says this? Many people make less than $700 a year. Number 5. What reason is given for giving extra money to the poorest countries in 2002? Listen again to part of the lecture.
Then answer the question. The World Bank is not like other banks. It's really a part of the United Nations. Number six. What does the speaker think about the World Bank? 